Well, good morning to you all. And uh, I'm, it's been two years since the last time I was here. It's been, been a long time, it seems. Uh, a lot of things have happened in that time, haven't they? And, uh, but once again, it's, it's always a blessing. You know, people ask me, how do I feel about coming to speak uh, to, to, to churches like this? And, and uh, my answer is always the same thing. You know, we are blessed. We are truly blessed. And, and of all things, can you imagine, uh, thank you very much to the, to the elders and to, to, to the pastoral staff for inviting me again. What a wonderful opportunity it is for me to be able to come and stand and, and talk about the things of God to the people of God. I mean, does it get any better than that? I'm not sure. So uh, blessings on you all, my brothers and sisters, for, for being here. Um, just a, a thought as we begin. Um, when, when I asked uh, Pastor Norman about, the, uh, about what he would like me to speak on, he said, just go ahead and speak on whatever you want to. That's always a very dangerous thing to do with me. Uh, but but even, even beyond that, just, just so you understand, um, I, I've wanted for years to preach a, about a six sermon series on one chapter, chapter, chapter five of, of Second Corinthians. Um, so today you're going to get the, the fourth, I guess, the fourth in the series. And maybe someday I'll write the rest of them too, but uh, you're going to get the fourth one in it. So the reason I say that is because recognize that, that I'm pulling something out of the middle of, of, of a very, very significant chapter. And we're going we're gonna to spend some time looking at that. Uh, allow me too to pray just for, for a second, please. Holy Spirit, speak through your word. Help us to, to know, overcome the, uh, the weaknesses of, of your servant as he looks at these things. Uh, help, help us all to hear what we need to hear, not what we want to hear, but what we need to hear. And I ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, way back in the, the middle of the last century, uh, it's, it's fun to say that, the last century, you know, middle of it. But it also gives you a hint about how old the speaker is. Um, I had dreamed that one day I might become a Canadian diplomat. You know what I mean by a diplomat, eh? okay? Uh, maybe even eventually an ambassador. Wouldn't that be wonderful to be an ambassador to, to foreign places? This was, this was kind of my dream. In fact, the year I was finishing my arts degree, I had written the Canadian Civil Service exam and the Foreign Service exam. Yes, they have exams to, to get into those things. I'd passed them both. Uh, by the way, you may wonder why the Foreign Service exam, and this is significant. Uh, because what, they, what they're looking for is they want to know how much you know about the world, but also to see um, if, if you understood what it meant to be a diplomat, if you understood what, what was involved in that process. And uh, if you understood what it meant to be a representative of the queen and the country. Anyway, uh, at the final interview, I was instructed to wait and that I would receive information on, on my first position, wherever it would be. So needless to say, I was thrilled. My dream was coming true. Uh, I, I was excited about it as, as the months went by, waiting. And as you know, unfortunately, dreams have a way of disappearing. Poof. Hmm. While I was waiting, the Canadian government announced they were putting a freeze on further hiring. And within a matter of a few days, I received a letter formally closing my application and inviting me to apply again in the future. Well, you know how things work. Time moves on and, and paths lead to other paths. And I, I never did reapply, actually. However, I'm telling you this story. I wouldn't want you to think that, that, that where I ended up was second best in my life. In retrospect, I realized that God had other plans for me. And I'm very grateful uh, for where he led me. But the story of being a diplomat does not quite end there. To see where it goes, we need, you know, we're going to take a look at some, some verses today. But before we do, before we look at the ones that are really critical, we have to look at Paul's words in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to, to, to 20, sorry, to 19. And uh, let's take a look at these words, and then, and then we'll see how it all sort of unfolds. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. 
that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Do you get those, those, those two lines? The minister of, ministry of reconciliation, the message of res- reconciliation. See, God still had and still does have a purpose for me and for you. Uh, even though I wasn't going to be a diplomat, he still had purposes for me. And we still have a role to represent him in this world. We still have a role. Now, I'm, this is not a message on recognition, re, uh, sorry, reconciliation. That's the third message in the, in the series that I haven't yet written. Reconciliation has everything to do yet what, with what we're going to be talking about as we go on. So let's stop and look at it a bit before we do move on. What does reconciliation mean? Most of you understand this. I'm not telling you anything new. Reconciliation is when two people or groups or things in a conflict are made to agree with each other. Uh, I'll, let me give you an example of it. At the end of her day, my, my, the woman I love works in a, in a volunteer in a, in a hospital gift shop. And at the end of her day, she runs a record of transactions from the till. And that's the official record for the day. Then she counts all of the money and the debits and the credits and everything and totals it and sees if it meets the official record. If they don't, she goes back over them to figure out why they do not match, why they conflict, and how to solve the differences. She's reconciling the two sets of figures, the, the ones that are to be, to be held believable, the ones that are considered to be solid, and the ones that are not, okay? In our portion of scripture that we've just been looking at, Paul is referring to a reconciliation of a similar sort. It ends the estrangement, the, the, the conflict, the lack of agreement caused by original sin between God and humanity. That's the reconciliation there. And just as in our example, God and his commandments are the true measure of where humanity should be. They're the record. They're the one that, is, cannot, that should not be questioned. They're the official record. God is the definition of perfection. Then they compare it to us. We're the other side of that. And of course, sadly, uh, we, and I'm speaking for myself, you know, have fallen short from birth, right? I don't match that record of God. We simply do not add up to the total that God represents and what he requires of us. We are in conflict with him. It's only when we understand that we have fallen short that we then turn and say, we need reconciliation. Our need for reconciliation with God is what leads us to repentance. Uh, It's a desire to turn from our conflict with God. The need for reconciliation is what leads us to a confession of our sins. The need for reconciliation is what leads us to confess Jesus, the source of reconciliation. It is only then that the old conflict with God is gone. Reconciliation means that we come into line with what God wants. We recognize that his way is the only way, that he alone is God. However, though reconciliation changes us from this old to this new creation, that doesn't end there. There's a role, there's a function, a service that goes with being reconciled. And that's what I really want to come to talk to you about today. It's what that role is. So let's go on and let's read the the, the next verse from this. From 2 Corinthians 5.20, it says, We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. You know, and and I remember, I mean, suddenly as I, I read this, I realize I'm an ambassador after all. My dream did not die. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. In fact, every one of you who has been reconciled to God through Jesus is an ambassador, is an ambassador. Reconciliation means that that we have the vision insofar as, as, as it's possible for any of us the same vision that God has for the world. Think about that. We have the same vision that God has. 
if we're reconciled. Only once we are reconciled with God can we truly be his representative in this world, his ambassador. You, me, anyone, anyone who confesses Jesus, we are all in that same boat. And we all have that role. We all have that position. Oh, you know, and I think to myself, it turns out that God had it planned that I would be an ambassador after all. Just not the one I thought I was going to be. So why is it important to spend time considering the concept of being Christ's ambassador? Because I think a lot of times those terms are used. You know, I've heard that in the last week, I've heard somebody reference being Christ's ambassador four times. Okay. Uh, we've read it. How many of you have read it? You've, you've read that term, isn't it, right? You've heard that. Okay. This is no problem. You hear that. And, you, and you know, and, and, and it sounds good. But the question is, do we actually understand what it means to be Christ's ambassador? Or, or are they just Christianese words we use? Do we appreciate how significant these words really are? And you know, how much we can learn if we just stop and take a look at them. Because you see, to be Christ's ambassador in many ways, if we're being effective as Christ's ambassadors, if, we're, if we are actually being his ambassadors, in many ways, it is a description of the Christian life. Uh, just, just so that you know this, um, the Greek that Paul used means, basically translates best out as trusted servant. Trusted servant. And, and I think that's what we have to carry with this idea of ambassadors. Are we trusted servants? Trusted to do things, trusted to represent, trusted to be, to be uh, you know, the, the face of Christ. An ambassador, so, so, so just, just as we're doing that, let's, let's take a short course in di diplomacy, okay? And, and, and I'll, let's explain some of the things we need to know about being Christ's ambassador and what it means. First off, an ambassador is uh, someone who has been sent to a country or a place or whatever, not his own, not his own. There is someone sent to another place for a purpose. You know, it would be easy from our standpoint to think, oh, we know ambassadors. They're called international workers, right? We send them off to other parts of the world and they serve Christ. They're Christ's ambassadors, right? And, and that would be easy to think of it in those terms. But that's not what Paul is talking about. Because what Paul is describing is this, that when you become reconciled to God, when you become a Christian, you become the citizen of a different kingdom. You become a citizen of God's kingdom. And your king is now the one we've been singing about, the king of kings. Uh, you know, how many, of those, how many times did we reference that? He's the king upon the throne, right? That's who we have moved to, to. That's the country we've moved into. That's our land now. Yes, we're still here. I'm not saying we have it. We've gone somewhere else. But our true citizenship is in a different kingdom. And it has been right from the time that we talked about that. And uh, in, in specifically in Philippians, Paul says that. He says, our citizenship is in heaven. Okay? We have become, as Moses said, a, 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 a foreigner in a foreign land now. Our obedience, our loyalty, our affections must be for the king that we now serve. We may still walk in this country among the peoples of this world, but we are no longer one of them. This, and I think we, we have to remind ourselves, this became a world that is not our own. Now, here's the thing. We cannot have two allegiances. You cannot serve in a foreign country, foreign land, uh, and, and be one of them and be one of your own home country. That doesn't work. You can only have one, one allegiance. And I'm not saying it's always easy to serve in a foreign land. It, it requires turning our, our, our backs on the cultural values of the world that we've come out of. And, that, and that's not easy. I've thought about it many times. So. If I had become a Canadian diplomat as I'd wanted to, I would have served at the pleasure of the Queen and the Canadian government, wherever they sent me, easy or hard. You know, I, I have dreams of serving somewhere in, a, in some beautiful old city in Europe or something, but probably I would have ended up counting paper clips in, I don't know, a jungle or a desert somewhere, because that's what happens. When you go to serve as a diplomat, you take whatever God sends you. You go where he tells, he tells you to go. You do whatever he tells you to do. As Christians, 
and as Christ's ambassadors, we serve at the pleasure of our king, the king of kings. And we should recognize it's an honor to do so, no matter where we get sent or what we do. That's the first thing that we must recognize is we're, if we're ambassadors, Christ's ambassadors. One of the other per major purposes of an ambassador is to defend the views, express the ideas, present the values of his or her kingdom. You know, and, and you know clearly that the words of an ambassador will not always be welcomed, especially when the ambassador challenges the values of the, of the, the country he's serving in. Uh, I don't know if you heard this, but a couple of weeks ago, the Canadian ambassador in Russia was called in by the R Russian government, you can imagine this, and warned about Canada's position in regard to the Ukrainian invasion. That's what happens. Sometimes you're not, the words are not welcomed. Uh, an ambassador, what does he do in that kind of situation? Well, he must remain diplomatic. That's necessary. He cannot just become totally, you know, go off the wall and call them names and whatever. He's got to remain diplomatic. Because if he's diplomatic, it's the only way he's heard in the end. If he, if he, if he, if he becomes um, wild in his process, people will simply stop listening to him. At any rate, not only must he remain diplomatic in his words, but he has to remain firm in his values. Even when he's standing in front of somebody, uh, 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 sorry, uh, 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 I'm gonna try and word this very carefully. In standing in front of an unhinged dictator, uh, yelling at him, he's gotta be able to, to stand and be diplomatic and still stand firm. He cannot back away from his values. That's essential. And I have a feeling one of these days it's gonna get even worse. Why do I point that out to you? Because that's the way we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be firm in our convictions, aren't we? We can't, we can't be wishy-washy. This is what we believe. It's all, these are the truths of the kingdom. And what are those truths? Well, the main one is that Jesus is the only way. That's a base truth. It's what we hold to be the fact. However, that doesn't mean we shouldn't be diplomatic in our approach to the, to, the, to the people around us in this foreign land in which we are serving. We should still be diplomatic in how we do it. Um, gosh, I can't tell you how many times I've looked at, at people, Christians, fellow ambassadors, who stand up at the street corners and say, if you continue to go this way, you're gonna go to hell and you're gonna be damned forever and you know, and that type of thing. They don't, they don't do a good service for us in many ways. Yeah, occasionally they reach people, but generally they don't. Uh, because what it does is it, 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 people stop listening to them for the most part. They stop listening to them. And, I, and I've seen an example of this in my life in my, with my own parents who, who one day were told, this, you're, you're dying and you're going to hell. It took me years to reach them, finally, so that they would understand that that message is not really what Christ is about. Christ is not saying you're dying and going to hell. He's saying you can live and find eternity. It's quite a different message, isn't it? By the way, it reminds me of the words of Peter in 1 Peter 3.15, where he says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. And you notice that line, but do this with gentleness and respect. Do this with gentleness and respect. For us, as Christ's ambassadors, even if we're threatened or challenged, it, you know, we still have to tell the citizens of this foreign land that we live in around us th that they're on a path to destruction. The destruction that makes the threat of, by the way, of, of, of war and atomic annihilation seem minor in reality. But at the same time, through Christ our King, we have to provide a true hope for them and tell it to them in a way that they will listen and hear us. It is telling the people of this world that God has offered the opportunity to be reconciled in him, that God is stronger than any power or weapons of this world. You know, that, that's how we have to go. And I, yes, I know the message will be offensive to many. It always will be. 
They don't want to hear it in some cases. However, we like good diplomats, though the message may be offensive, we must not be offensive in the, in the way we present it. And so that's another thing an ambassador learns. He learns how to speak to people. He learns how to, to reach them with, with these kinds of values. One thing I should point out to you is that there's a, there's a real danger for ambassadors that we should also mention at this point. If an ambassador spends too much time in a foreign country or becomes too close to the citizens of that country, there's a danger that rather than, in, than in presenting the values of the country, of our country, the heavenly kingdom, they can begin to identify with the cultures and thinking of the country they are in. You get what I'm saying? They begin to think in the terms of that country's values. And by the way, that's not only true of ambassadors, it's also true of journalists and business people as well. Uh, this is what's happened to a number of diplomats over the years uh, who, who spent too long in, 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 for example, the Middle East, uh, where there, there are conflicting narratives about history. And, and they begin to absorb those and begin to think in those terms. Uh, and, and then they no longer serve the, the, the kingdom that, that they were sent out by. They're no longer ambassadors. They no longer represent the people that they, that they were sent there by. They begin to represent the people in that. So how does that affect us if we're Christ ambassadors? The same problem. We will continue to live in this kingdom. We will continue to live here as we serve God. But we must not, we must not be attracted to the values of this world. We have to remember that we, our values that we represent are the values of the kingdom of God, not the values of the world around us. Reminds me of a, one of the slides, uh, one of the verses that, 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 that I have to keep bringing to my own head. And it's from James 127. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress. And here's the key one to keep oneself from being polluted by the world, to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Boy, I'll tell you, um, this is a tough one. Uh, we have to make sure that, that our priorities never slip, that we remain concerned with the things of God's kingdom, not the things of this world. You know, think about the things that draw us away, uh, politics, entertainment, the cult of celebrity, all these things pulling and calling for your attention and saying, come, come, look, we've got something here for you, or, you know, or, or you need to think this, or, or, or whatever. Um, we have to guard against all this kind of stuff. We can't get tied up in it. We will lose the values that we're here for, if we do. I was thinking about a, a Christian friend of mine who, as soon as he starts to talk about, uh, about um, some things gets he gets angry and upset and irritated and, you know, and whatever. As soon as I see that, I say to myself, I think he's spending too much time thinking about the wrong things. The things of God should not make us angry and upset. They should bring peace to us. And if we are finding our, that we're too involved with some of these things, I think we have to say, are we allowing ourselves to be pulled by the world? Are we losing our values in some ways? I, th I think that's, that's a very good measure of it. There's another important task that an ambassador in a foreign country has. And uh, time, time for me to tell you another story. Uh, again, back in the middle of the last century, um, along with a group of other Canadian students, I had, the, I had just this amazing opportunity to study archeology span in Rome, in Rome itself. Uh, we were based at the British Academy in Rome. Uh, can you imagine how wonderful that was? Wandering the, through, the, through the streets of Rome, and, you know, learning the history and, and everything. Just, oh, uh, sorry, I, I get lost when I start to talk about it. In the middle of the term, all of the Canadian students were invited to a special evening reception, a tea, if you would call it that, to be held at the Academy Gardens. And the Academy's a beautiful big old building. And when the day arrived, after a hot, sweaty day walking among the, the ruins of ancient Rome, the woman I love, and I cleaned up, we put on the best clothes we had with us, and headed off to this, if you can picture the evening coolness in this garden, of this, of this beautiful academy gardens with the trees and everything. It's just, just, 
you know, it's, it's like a movie scene. <laughs> if you've ever seen a movie with that kind of a scene, you know, and here's this middle class boy from the prairies dressed up in his Sunday go to meeting clothes, standing in this beautiful Italian garden. Now, Here's where we get it to it. The reason for the reception was part of what made it special and why it sticks in my memory. The reason was because the Canadian ambassador to Italy wanted to personally meet the students, all the Canadian students, and to encourage them. And, and you know, and, to, and to just to try and, and, and make them feel like they were welcome and that he was there for them. You see, that's one of the things an ambassador does. A, a, an ambassador is there also to encourage and to support and to serve the citizens of, of, of his or her country in the foreign land where they are. Does that make sense? Sorry, I, I don't know if I'm making that clear. That's part of his job, is to do that, to go and be there among them. Uh, recently, we saw a, a perfect example of this, didn't we? When the Canadian ambassador in China was trying to help the two Michaels, right? That's what he was doing. That's part of his job, is to do that. Even in Paul's time, ambassadors took on this role in the Roman world. Uh, though I gotta be honest about this, you can bet that they mostly represented and helped uh, the wealthy and powerful, you know, not, not the, poor, the poor people in the street, you can bet on that one. But, but in our world, they do. In our world, they should be doing those things. Each one of us who wants to seriously be an ambassador of Christ must be prepared to encourage, to help, to welcome the fellow citizens of the kingdom of God as they live in this foreign world. Oh, wait a minute now. We have a responsibility for each other? You betcha we have responsibility for each other. That's exactly the point. We are commanded by Christ to love one another. Uh, I can't help but think of a, of a, of a wonderful example from Paul's life. Where in, in, Paul was imprisoned in Rome, okay, it's just that simple, and probably expecting to be executed when he wrote this. In his second letter to Timothy, he says this, May the Lord show his mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, because he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. On the contrary, when he was in Rome, he searched hard for me until he found me. May the Lord grant that he will find mercy from the Lord on that day. You know very well in how many ways he helped me in Ephesus. Anesiphorus was a true ambassador of Christ. He was supporting the people. He was supporting them. By the way, there's another example in Philippians, uh, if you look at Paphrod Paphroditus. Why do I tell you this? Why do I make this point? Well, this is why. Particularly in this time, as our churches are beginning to reopen with in-person worship. You're here, right? In-person worship, good. And other community activities. It is important that we remind ourselves that our fellow citizens in the kingdom of God need us to be here. The people of our churches are some of those citizens. Like that ambassador in Rome had come to encourage the students, and me being one of them, we need to be an encouragement and a help to each other. You need to be Christ's ambassador in my life and I need to be in your lives. You know, though we may have found it convenient to sit at home and watch uh, church services on television or monitors, though we may, that may have been convenient. I mean, let's face it, it's easy, isn't it? You get up in the morning, you don't even have to take off your pajamas. You take a cup of coffee, you sit in front of it, and it's great, right? Though it may be easy to do that, it fails in one regard, in that we need to be together. We need to be among other Christians, serving them and allowing them to serve us. Now, I know that that's not totally easy in some cases, um, you know, because of the, 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 the situations that we're in uh, with, with, with everything. And, and, uh, but, but I would say this, whenever we feel we can finally get back, whenever we feel it's safe, whenever, whatever, we have to get back. 
we cannot simply make that as our, as our future way of doing church. That denies what it means to be a Christ, Christ ambassador. We have to be among others. We have to encourage them. As a matter of fact, Colossians, in, in Colossians 3.15, this is, this is actually the, the, the other section of scripture that I'd originally planned to talk to you about, but then changed my mind. Well, maybe God changed my mind. Leave that to be, okay? But, but listen to these words. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, since as members of one body you are called to peace, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your heart to God. How do you do that in front of a TV set? How do you display the oneness of peace with the body in front of a TV set? How do you teach and admonish one another with, with, you know, if you decide that you're not going to come back to church? You can't do it. You can't do it. And, and my point is not to harp on this, but just to say, man, as we come out of these times, it's tough. It's tough. But we've got to make a concentrated effort. We've got to be disciplined in our own souls and say, we have to move this way. We have to move this way. You get what I'm trying to say? There's no choice. Otherwise, we are not doing what we need to be doing. See, it's not just about me. It's about the whole kingdom. Sorry, I've been at that long enough. That's, that's what happens when you let an old guy speak, you know? He gets, he gets going and excited and, you know, whatever. Uh, there's a fourth thing. As I look and I talk about ambassadors, an ambassador is the personification of their country and people. And you're going to say, what, what, run around that one by me again. A personification. In other words, within the person, um, you should see the country and the people. Like, like when they walk in the door, you should say, ah, that's a, that's a, that's a Canadian. That's a, you know, like it, they should be, it should be part of their very character. Uh, when the people of the foreign lands sees the, the, these ambassadors, they should see the values of the, the ambassador's homeland being walked out in their lives. If they are an example of a kingdom, they must be strive to be a true representative of the monarch. I'm sorry, I love that picture of the, of the, the, the piece of the, for those of you who are chess players, you know exactly what that, what that, what that means. So you see the pawn, but through the pawn you see the, the king. And that's the point. That's the point. Um, everything that we think, say, or do represents the king. And that's a hard one. There's no room or there should be no room for self-indulgence or hypocrisy. It should always be in our minds that we represent the king. As I say, it's a hard call. Why is it hard? Well, because we, I think we all know the answer. Jesus is perfect. I am not. It's hard for me to do this. It really is. How can I, how can I walk out a life of perfection when I'm not perfect? That's, that's, that's not an easy thing to do. And, and it's even scarier because a few times in my life, I've had situations where somebody has come to me and said something, something like this. They said, uh, I watched you when this thing happened and noticed how you acted, and noticed how you acted. Has anybody had that besides me? And my reaction to that was to be scared, to be frightened, because what it means is, even though I may not be noticing it, people are watching me, and they're saying, and, and this is exactly what, he, what this, the one person was saying, is he said, I wanted to see whether, what you did, to see whether you actually walked as a Christian, because he knew I was. And, and that's what it's saying, is it's saying that whether you notice it or not, other people see you. Oh yeah, most of the time they don't see you. Most of the time the people in this world ignore us. Let's be honest. We might as well be invisible a lot of the time, right? But just sometimes they're watching you. And do you act like a Christian? You say, wow, that's a load, isn't it? That means I have to always act like a Christian. Yes. It's exactly what it means, isn't it? 
And that's a tough, that's a tough load to carry. That's where we need prayer. That's where we need, we need the Holy Spirit to help us. But it is what we must do. Do my actions and words display a loving, compassionate, generous, forgiving king? Or do they display a, a, with the weaknesses and shortcomings of a failed human being? That's the question. Which do they do? We're blessed that because of Jesus, even our failures are forgiven. And it's only because of Jesus that we can even begin to represent the king. You see what I'm saying about the, when I said early on about the fact that these are all the steps of being a Christian, aren't they? Being a Christ's ambassador brings us back to being what it means to be a Christian. So what do we do in order to display the king we represent? We open our hearts to the king and we allow him to direct us as much as we can. We aim for holiness and ask the Holy Spirit to lead us. Uh, and I'm not talking about the holiness of dry rules and legalism. You know, the, the kind of stuff that they used to preach is holiness. And you don't go to movies, you don't do this, you don't do That's not what I'm talking about. That's only an imitation of holiness. Instead, we aim for a holiness that, that, we, that we see in Jesus, in his actions, his compassion, his love, all the things that he showed to the world. We aim for that kind of holiness, a holiness based on, on trying to be as much like Jesus as we can. Remember, we represent the, the king, and that's what we have to do. Uh, I'm reminded of a song. I would sing it for you, except you wouldn't want to hear it. Uh, where one of the, the big lines is, you're the only Jesus that some will ever see. And that's what we mean. You're the only Jesus that some will ever see. There's one last thing that we need to know about being an ambassador. Uh, I think my time is getting very close to, to, to being finished as well here, isn't it? Somebody want to give me a warning? How much time? <laughs> Am I okay for a bit, few minutes yet? Okay. There's one last thing we need to note about being an ambassador. We always must remember where our true home is. Eventually, every ambassador will go home. Our world will not necessarily appreciate an ambassador from another kingdom, and especially Christ's ambassadors. And in many cases, such ambassadors are said to be expelled from the land they serve in. An ambassador is prepared to be expelled when they speak hard truths. In the case of Christ's ambassadors, we may face being expelled from the world ruled by sin, the flesh, and the devil. We too must be prepared to be expelled. I think of uh, in Ephesians 6, Paul says these words. Uh, when, he's, when he's talking to, to the, the Ephesians, he says, Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. And you ready? Here it is. For which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly, fearlessly as I should. That's the other thing that we have to be prepared for. Paul was eventually expelled from this world by beheading. Um, I'm... I'm I've heard it said that from the voice of martyrs who, who look after this thing, that more people have been, have been expelled in the 20th century than all the other centuries combined from this foreign world. Interesting. Even if we are not expelled from this foreign land that we live in, we will still one day be called home. Every ambassador is eventually called home. We must always remember that no matter what our life has been like here, good or bad. This is not our home. We are citizens of another kingdom, a kingdom where one day we'll be welcomed home by God. One day we will stand in the throne room of God and hopefully hear him say, well done, well done. And that's what we should be reminding ourselves. That's what this is all about in the end, is serving God, being good ambassadors. You know, I, I can't help, but I, I, as I was writing this, I, I kept hearing these words. I don't know if you've ever heard of B.J. Thomas. Some of you younger people might not have heard of him. Some of the older people have him. 
B.J. Thomas was, a, was a, a singer and a songwriter who became a Christian, and he wrote a song called uh, Home Where I Belong. And, and these are the words in it, and some of the words in it, some of the words in it. Just, he says, and sometimes when I'm dreaming, it comes as no surprise that if you look and see the homesick feeling in my eyes, I'm going home, going home where I belong. While I'm here, I'll serve him gladly and sing him all my songs. I'm here, but not for long. And when I'm feeling lonely and when I'm feeling blue, it's such a joy to know that I am only passing through. I'm heading home, going home where I belong. And as an ambassador here in this world, as we live our lives, as we preach, as we talk, as we live out and represent the king, that's our final thought that we need, is to remember that one day we too will go home where we belong. And, that's, and I think that's where we have to, in the end, recognize our hope, because that's it. Let me just pray for you for a few seconds. Father, you, you call us to be servants. It's not enough to just be uh, somebody who has accepted Christ. That's not enough. You call us to be servants, to be disciples, to, to, to represent you in this world. Some of us do it well, some of us hardly. I pray that, that you would help us each to know the right way to do this. Help us each to, to see and understand what you have for us. That, that, that we could be good servants and that one day when we do go home, you will be there and say, well done, good and faithful servant. And I thank you, knowing that one day that home is waiting for each of us. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for the message, Pastor Jim.